How great is our God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brigham. Thank you, worship team. Ushers come with an outline for anyone who missed one on the way in. If you need an outline, raise your hand and they will get one to you straight away. Greetings to our brothers and sisters in Winthrop. What a joy it is to be partnering with you and taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the great city of Winthrop. And 12 weeks from today, I'll be sending that same greeting to Danvers, uh, Massachusetts, as God has continued to enlarge our borders. And we give him all the glory and the honor and the praise. And about 250 of you will not be here, but rather you will be hearing that greeting at the Danvers YMCA. Uh, and so uh, thank you for whatever you do. Do not miss that meeting on February 16th, 10 a.m. right here. Uh, that meeting doesn't obligate you to go to Danvers, but if you're open to whatever God might want to do with your life, which would be all of us here, otherwise, why would you be here? Then uh, you want to be at that meeting on February 16th at 10 a.m. And uh, uh, praise God for just the way he's continuing to grow our church with Pastor Brigham's uh, move to Danvers. We, uh, that means we need a new worship leader here. And uh, just walking in the door, coming down this aisle so you can get a good look at her. Would you welcome our new worship leader, Joy Solomon. <laughs> that lady you just hugged, Joy, when I, she asked about you when you led worship a few times ago. And she said, uh, dude. <laughs> now, that's really not the right way to address your pastor. But you have to consider the source. And uh, she said, dude, you better grab that girl <clears throat> before she gets away. And so uh, we did. And we thank the Lord for, for adding her to our staff. Again, our sympathies go out to Lance Ball and Jim Wilkins on the passing of their dear and precious mothers. I do not know the age of Jim's mom, but Lance's mother was 98 years of age. And so good long life. And then... Um, I'm told that Melissa Dixon is in the service. We uh, said goodbye to her husband, just 37 years young, and uh, uh, leaves his wife and four children uh, with us as a church family to take care of. Amen? Amen? Amen. Melissa, just wave at me if you're here. Melissa, where, where are you there? She is over here. God bless you. We love you, and we're praying for you. And uh, again, we are here for you. Finally, my <clears throat> because you demand it, my brother has two grandsons. Well, I've got one granddaughter and she is just beyond description. And she wanted to say hello this morning. I don't know if she's going to be a singer or a preacher or probably both, but uh, we're going to miss her while we are in Tanzania, though I'm sure I will buy her some appropriate clothes. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles. If you don't understand the joke, you'll have to ask later. But anyway, <clears throat> turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 10. I have not forgotten about our study through the gospel of Mark actually been saving this passage just for today. Uh, we've been in our month of personal commitment to the various spiritual disciplines. We do this every January. You say, Pastor Tim, it's now February. I know, but we had an ice storm one Sunday that kind of bumped the preaching schedule. And so uh, every January we make a fresh new commitment to the spiritual disciplines of prayer, of the word of God serving. And, um, and then the subject before us today. And listen, these spiritual disciplines 
are important because they are our lifeline to staying connected to God, staying connected to his purposes for our lives and staying connected to his blessings. How many know that God does want to bless his children? Amen. Hey, about 36% of you, okay. <laughs> some of you are really gonna learn some things today. <clears throat> well, today's everyone's favorite in this sermon series uh, it, because we're gonna be talking about the all-important subject of giving, what that looks like and how it's supposed to work in our lives. Now, if you thought that this sermon was usually the last sermon of January, uh, which you missed last week, and you came today hoping that you would have missed this sermon, <laughs> what can I say? God has you right where he wants you. I know some might not think that this is an important issue or really a very uh, relevant discipline for our lives, but we looked at a Bible story uh, back on November 11th. How many of you remember the sermon from November 11th? <clears throat> That's what I thought. Uh, how many of you remember the sermon from last week? No, no, don't answer that question. But maybe you remember the title from November 11th. The title was So Close and Yet So Far. And in that story, we were introduced to a very rich young man who, who said he wanted to be close to God, said he wanted to inherit eternal life. But Jesus pointed out the idol in his life, the same idol that is in the hearts of many people who say they want to be close to God. And the Bible says that that man, it says something about that man that it says about no other man in all the Bible. It says that man went away from Jesus sad and sorrowful. That story is the prelude to our passage today. So let's go back and just read it real quick to introduce us to the second half of the story, which will be our focus for today. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17, here's what we read. And as he, referring to Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. And we were reminded that you can't do anything to inherit eternal life. You can't be good enough. You can't give enough. You can't, you're not smart enough. Uh, you're not strong enough. The only way you inherit eternal life is to humbly receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It is a gift that is received by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Verse 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. In other words, Jesus is God. Verse 19, Jesus said, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Think of that statement. Now he's probably not saying that he's been perfect. He's just saying, listen, I knew all, I know all the rules. I've made a commitment to adhering to them and tried to live according to them all my life. Verse 21, and Jesus looking at him, loved him. Jesus looking at him, loved him. Now I know some of you have a hard time believing that Jesus loves you, but I'm here to tell you that he does. I sit with people all the time. People come to me for counsel. They don't really want my counsel, but they come to me <laughs> for counsel. And listen, when you come to me and I talk with you, I have one agenda, to love you. Amen. To give you the best counsel I can, I can to experience the greatest blessings of God you can in your life. Amen. That is my only agenda. It's the only agenda I have. But sometimes it doesn't come across as clearly as we would like it to. Sometimes people think, well, you know, Pastor, you're, you know, you're being hard on me. You're being tough on me. No, 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 no. Listen, it's the one who really loves you that tells you the truth. Anybody can lie to you. Anybody can tell you what you want to hear. It's people who care about you and love you that tell you the truth. And so that's what Jesus is about to do with this young man. Seems like a great guy. Seems to have a blessed life. Jesus looks at him and scripture doesn't want us to miss it. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Now how many, you'd be happy to just sell if it was only one thing. I mean, 
Wow, Jesus, if I'm only missing one thing, I'm feeling really good. Some of us, Jesus would say, let me open the scroll here. Yeah. He said, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. We're talking about giving today. And Jesus is making the point that our real treasures are in heaven. And they're not treasures of gold and silver. They're treasures that are stored there for us because we made an investment in the eternal kingdom of God. Amen. And there will be countless multitudes there, as you heard our missionaries say today, because we gave to the kingdom of God, because we gave to missions. Amen. And we'll meet people there for the first time in our life who are there because we gave to the kingdom. Amen. Look at verse 22. Disheartened by the saying... He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, this lesson is not lost on Peter and the disciples. I mean, if anyone would have been perceived to be blessed of God, it would have been this rich young ruler. He's clearly a religious person. He's tried to obey all the law. He's rich and wealthy, which would have been interpreted, especially in that community, in that context, in that culture. Being rich and wealthy would have been interpreted as a sign of God's blessings and a lot of people still interpret that uh, that way today. And this man's interaction with Jesus is going to elicit a number of questions from the disciples about giving and about serving Jesus. So we keep reading verse 23. And Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, he said to this young man, sell everything you got, come follow me. The man goes away sad. Now Jesus turns to his disciples and says, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again. Now I mentioned this last week, but here it is in our text again this week. Sometimes Jesus has to say things to us twice. And some of you more than twice. <laughs> Parents, how many times do we have to say something to our child? Be a lot. So Jesus said to them again, children, see, they, there's his children. Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. For all things are possible with God. I don't care what impossibility or perceived impossibility you think you face today. Jesus says all things are possible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. Peter began to say to him, see... Now, they've just seen this rich young ruler get turned away because he wouldn't give. Peter says, see, we have left everything and followed you. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me for a word of prayer? Father God, we've just read about one person who wouldn't give what you asked them to give and others who gave up everything to follow you. I suspect, Lord, there's a lot of us that are somewhere in between those two. I suspect there's not very many of us that have had to give up everything to follow you. Perhaps a few. But Lord, teach us what it means to have the heart of a giver today. Because Jesus, we want to be just like you. Hide your servant behind the cross. May Jesus Christ be high and lifted up, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. amen. <clears throat> the title of our message is what God does when we give. Peter says, Jesus, <clears throat> apparently that rich young ruler isn't going to make it. He didn't understand the importance of giving, but Jesus, just to be clear, uh, just a reminder, uh, just reminding you, Jesus, we have left everything. We have given up everything to follow you. Yeah. 
Now, can we just be honest and admit that most of us cannot say that today? Thank God for missionaries like Patrick and Jeannie Collins, who in fact know all about the sacrifices that have to be made to leave everything this world has to offer to go to a foreign land and give your life preaching the gospel. Most of us don't know what that kind of sacrifice is all about. But hear me, loved ones, though we may not be asked to do what others have done, make no mistake about it, Jesus asked us to give him everything. Everything. In fact, there is a one thing in all of our lives. Just like this rich young ruler, there is a one thing in all of our lives that we tend to cling to, we tend to hang on to. And sooner or later, if we're going to truly follow Jesus Christ, he will say to us, surrender that one thing and come follow me with all your heart. But there's another question that Peter has for Jesus. And we find it in the parallel passage of this story. This story is told in three gospels. So if we're being told something three times, probably the Holy Spirit is wanting us to sit up and take notice. And so the story is told in Matthew's gospel. And in Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, same event. <clears throat> Here's what we read. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. But he adds a question that isn't recorded to Mark. Here's what Peter asks. What then will we have? Thank God for Peter. Because he asked the questions we are all thinking but are too afraid to ask. Hello? Come on now, let's be open and honest about this subject today. After all, this is part of our struggle when it comes to the subject of giving. In our heart of hearts, we want to give more, we want to do more. But there's this concern or fear or lack of faith that if I really give to Jesus and give to his kingdom work like I know I should, what then will I have? And after all, even Peter asked that question. And the reason we're afraid to ask that question out loud is because it sounds a bit selfish, doesn't it? But amazingly, Jesus treats it as a legitimate question. He doesn't reprove or reprimand Peter for asking. He understands our selfish insecurities. And he tries to address them for us if we will only have an ear to hear what Jesus is saying. So I want you to notice how Jesus responds to Peter's question. And then we're going to look at three things that God does when we give. Verse 28, Mark 10, 28. Peter began to say to him, see, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, which means you can take it to the bank. Truly, I say to you, there is no one. There is who? No there is no one. There is no one over here. There's no one over here. There is no one over here. There is no one over here. Oh, yes. There's no one up there. You folks that are more spiritual than the rest of us because you're closer to heaven. There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel. Verse 30, who will not receive. Who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, don't miss this part, with persecutions, Jesus didn't promise us a rose garden. It's not going to be all easy peasy. His blessings are going to be there, but persecutions come with anyone who's going to follow Jesus Christ. And in the age to come, eternal life. Don't miss verse 31. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Three things God does when we give. Number one, God recognizes when we give. God recognizes when we give. Jesus said, there is no one, and I'm going to kind of wear those two words out today because it's hard for us to believe we're one of the no one. There is no one, Jesus said, who gives that will not receive. Whenever I speak on the subject of giving, I, I prefer speaking primarily from the teaching of Jesus. I mean, the Bible is filled with teaching and scriptures and instruction on giving, but I like to quote Jesus directly because then those who have an issue with giving 
And there are always a few. I can always say, well, look, take that up with Jesus. I didn't say that. He did. Take it up with Jesus. And what Jesus is teaching us here is that no one, no one over here, 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 or up there, no one gives without Jesus being aware of it. No one gives without God recognizing it. So Jesus is taking note of what we give or don't give. If you don't believe me, look at Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 43, uh, actually 41 to 44, I guess it is. And he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Jesus watched people putting money into, can you believe Jesus did that? Can you believe he's still doing it today? (laughs) Many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Verse 43, and he called his disciples to him. See here, remember we talked about holy huddles last week. Here goes another one. Jesus says, hey boys, come here, come here. (laughs) He called his disciples to him and he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more. Yes, Jesus is counting has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Verse 44, I left it off in the outline and that's why they didn't have it in the first service, but by now they got it because they are just outstanding. For they all, Jesus still, who's talking here? Who's talking here? Jesus. Jesus. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in, put in what? There's that word again, everything has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. What's the point? The point is God is watching what we give. God recognizes what we give. God knows the heart behind why and what we give. And Jesus said, not one who gives will not receive. In fact, in Matthew 10, 42, Jesus says, and whoever gives, whoever, what? Gives. I'm not supposed to look at the screens. Sorry. (laughs) Whoever gives one of these little ones, even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. In other words, even if what, even if what you're giving seems to be a little thing in the eyes of man, even just a cup of cold water in God's eyes, it is something worth recognizing and something worth rewarding. And there's a biblical principle here that we want to be sure we do not miss. Any time and every time we honor God, he recognizes it and blesses it. Anything and everything we give to God, he recognizes it and blesses it. And the blessings all begin, listen carefully, the blessings all begin when we give our hearts and lives to God. You may be here today and you're just not sure whether or not you can trust God with your life. I can promise you this. God blesses everything you give to him. You give him your life today like someone did in the first service and you will begin to experience blessings like you have never known before. I promise you this. God can do so much more with your life than you can do with it. Give your life to Jesus today. He will recognize it. And even as you've made a commitment to honor God God will honor and bless you. Number two, God rewards when we give. He not only recognizes when we give or what we give, but he rewards when we give. Now I know, I know, I know. The super spiritual people here, you just don't like to hear any teaching about getting rewards. I mean, this really messes with your head. You get concerned about people giving for the wrong motivation. You know, people shouldn't give to get. I understand all of that. I get all of that. But I'm stuck. I'm stuck with Jesus and his teaching on the subject. Hebrews 11, 6, pretty well-known verse tells us this. And without faith, it's impossible to please him, that is God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists And that he what? Rewards those who seek him. You can't read the Bible and fail to see that God is a rewarder. 
We set ourselves to 21 days of prayer and fasting and God rewarded us with a campus in Danvers to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You surrender your life to Jesus Christ and you get the reward of Jesus now and eternity in heaven with him forever and forever and forever. Now listen, don't tell me you don't believe in rewards because all of us work for reward every week. It's called a paycheck. Not very many people would work without a paycheck. Sometimes people want the pastor to do that. Thankfully, not any around here. But in some churches, they don't even understand why they're supposed to pay the pastor. And then some of us work even harder because we want to get a bigger reward at the end of the year. We want to get a big bonus, want to get a promotion, want to get a raise. Oh, we believe in rewards. But here's the question I want to ask you. Who is the rewarder or who is the blesser in your life? Now, spell check said blesser wasn't a word, so I made it one. (laughs) Who's the blesser in your life? That's an important question because if you think you are your own provider, if you think you are your own rewarder or you are the one responsible for the blessings in your life, Well, if you really believe that, guess how you're going to handle money and earthly possessions? You're going to hang on to them for all your worth. But if you believe that God is the one who rewards and God is the one who blesses, then you're going to take a completely different view on the subject and issue of giving. And when Jesus tells you to give a cup of water in his name, you're going to give it. Even if it's the last cup of water you have. May even be a little cup. Time for the unveiling. Jesus says, give that cup of water. And you go, okay, I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it. But you know, it's just a little cup, Jesus. It's not very much. And Jesus, you know, it's all I got. But Jesus said to do it, so, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. What, but, but it's the only bottle I got. I know he's asked me to do it. I, I, I have to do it. I have to. But I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get thirsty. It's the last water bottle I got. I mean, what am I going to do when I don't have any more water? Jesus says, give it. Thank you, Jesus. Wait, but he said he'd give back to me. I'm going to trust him to give back to me. And uh, you don't really have to bend God's arm to get, get it. But uh, sometimes, it, you know, the illustration doesn't work with you like you'd want. Well, I didn't get it all back, but at least I got a little something back. You know what? I'm going to be grateful. I gave to God and he gave me a little something back. And I'm, I'm just going to be content and I'm going to be, I'm going to be thankful. Amen. Except that attitude is absolutely unscriptural. And completely contrary to what Jesus is teaching us in this story today. Yes. Let me read it to you again from Mark chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is who? No one. No one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not what? Who will not receive. Who will not receive how much? A hundredfold. And when do we receive it? Now. 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 In this time. Now I know. I, I know. I know that just sounds... That the pastor, that doesn't, that just doesn't sound right. It sounds too good to be true. Listen, Jesus said it a hundredfold. I think that's like a 10,000% return. How many would say that's a pretty good investment? Huh? Not very many hands. You know why? Because you trust the stock market more than you trust Jesus. I got one agenda to tell you the truth because I love you. Millions of Christians trust the stock market more than they trust Jesus. 
Let me show you. He said a hundredfold. Let me show you what a hundredfold looks like. Let me show you what a hundredfold looks like. This is what a hundredfold looks like. This is what Jesus has promised. Pastor Brigham, maybe you could come and, and, and help me here. This is what a hundredfold looks like. And Pastor Brigham is going to come and he's going to just start filling this up with these water bottles to illustrate to us when Jesus says, when you give to me, I'm going to give back to you a hundredfold. We're going to get an idea here of what that really, really looks like. But while he's doing that, let me read a couple more scriptures to you. Can you do two things at one time? Okay. Some of you can. Proverbs eleven twenty four. Proverbs eleven twenty four says this. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give. I find it interesting there that the, that the scripture says they withhold what they should give. Yeah. You withholding what you should be giving? They withhold what they should give and only suffer want. That same passage in the message reads like this. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. How about Luke 6, 38? Jesus talking again. I, I apologize for quoting Jesus in church even. Luke 6, 38, Jesus says, first word, give. give. It, it won't hurt you to say the word, okay? It won't, uh, it won't automatically remove any money from your bank account. Just, 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 just try saying it. Give, and it will be given to you. How's it going to be given back? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, Running over will be put into your lap for with the measure you use, you decide. You decide whether you're going to be blessed or not. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. How about 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6? Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Verse 8, and God is able to bless you. How? You don't believe that. You don't believe that. God is able to bless you abundantly. Oh, if we would dare to believe the word of God, how it would change our lives. God is able to bless you abundantly so that, here we go, for those of you concerned about wrong motives, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This is why my daddy, he taught us, you always put something in the offering. Every time the offering comes by, you put something in the offering. And uh, this is true in Africa, Jackie and I know, uh, and they take lots of offerings in Africa. And uh, every time you're expected to put something in, uh, in the offering. But the point that's being made here is that, that God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. So maybe some of you are feeling a little better now about our motivation for giving. For truly, we give to be a blessing. We don't give to get. But here's the bottom line. God can only bless what we give him. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll, once God blesses me, then I'll give. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. God can only bless what we give him. But to be sure, he blesses us to make us a blessing. And sometimes it's the self, sometimes those self-righteous uh, ones who make an argument against giving because someone might not be giving for the right reason. Sometimes that self-righteous person just doesn't want to admit their reason for keeping rather than giving. It's called selfishness. Let me give you one more verse as we approach the top. Oh, this verse is going to fit in here. Maybe you've heard of Malachi 3.10. Let me read it to you. Bring the what? The whole tithe. It cracks me up when people say, well, Pastor, I'm tithing 5%. You, you don't understand. The definition of tithe is 10%. You can't tithe 2% or 8%. Or, if you're tithing, that's 10%. That's what God says. That's the, that's the baseline for giving to him. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's God's house. Why? So that there may be food in my house. In other words, resources for ministry. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, we're there, Pastor Brigham. <laughs> Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much what? Blessing. Blessing. Yeah. Pour
pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is what Jesus does in our life when we commit to be a giver. Whoa, whoa. We don't, we don't want to make too much of a mess for our cleaning staff here. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Brigham. Uh, and, and notice, we're not even going to put the lid back in, back on. Because you know what? God's not a God of the lid. God's, God's a, a God of the overflowing blessing. Huh? <laughs> Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. Please notice that that verse tells us that we have a God who loves to bless his children. And again, I got to tell you, a lot of you, you just don't have that view of God. Do you view God as a generous God who loves to bless? If you do, then you will want to be like him and you will find it easy to be generous and to be a blessing to others because you know that you cannot outgive your generous heavenly father. But if you view God as a tight fisted, judgmental, critical God, who's always finding fault with you, then guess what? You're going to hang on to everything you got. Listen, there's a big difference in wanting to be blessed versus wanting to be rich. A big difference. Maybe you didn't know it before today, but the Bible is pro-blessing. God wants to bless his people. We do not serve a tight-fisted God. And the Bible is filled with stories and references to God blessing his people. I think of Jacob of old who wrestled with God and said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Or how about Jabez who prayed, oh, that you would bless me, God, and enlarge my border and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm. That desire for God's blessing so that we might be a blessing is what leads us to become great givers. For the only way to blessing is through giving. It's the only way. You get rich by gathering. You're blessed by giving. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, Proverbs 10, 22. The blessings of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it. In other words, when you get plenty God's way, you don't have any regrets. Jackie and I had two big ticket items. Musicians come, we'll pretend like we're quitting. Jackie and I had two big ticket items on our list for 2018. Two things, not that we wanted, two things that we really, really needed that just weren't in the budget. So we started saving what little bit we could and prayed for the rest. Last year, God gave us both of those big ticket items. No, no, no. Gave us those big ticket items. We paid zero for both of them. God is good. Didn't pay a penny. And I don't know. I don't know if our increased faith promise to missions because we increase our faith promise every year. And this year increased it percentage-wise more than we have in previous years. Just felt like we were supposed to. I don't know if that had anything to do with those blessings, but I know you cannot outgive God. Now, someone might say, aha, so you were giving to missions to get from God. Well, aha, right back to you. (laughs) No, I was giving to missions because that's where my heart is. So that's where my treasure is also. Listen, there's a lot of things I could have if I if that was my priority, but it's not. I was giving to missions because that's a priority in my life. I I was giving to missions because there's a third thing that God does when we give. When we give, God realigns our priorities. Last point, God realigns our priorities when we give. For most people in this world, those apart from a relationship with God, Their entire life is all about gathering and getting as much as they can get. Their focus primarily, if not entirely, is on and about themselves. And that is as contrary to the ways of the kingdom of God as anything could possibly be. But people have a hard time getting it. Christians, because we live in this world system that is so messed up, and I'd like to use a stronger word, but folks, as horrible as... The Roe v. Wade decision was back in 1973. You see where this week, where it has led us to, where now we're ready to kill babies after they're born. After they're born. This is the world system that we live in. It is completely contrary to the kingdom of God. 
And as contrary as that is to the heart of God and everything about the heart of God, the way we handle resources and finances is it's just completely upside down from God's way of living a blessed life so that we can be a blessing. I close with two verses. The verse where Jesus speaks to the rich young ruler and the last thing he says to the disciples in this story. Mark 10, 21. And Jesus, looking at him, looking at that rich young ruler, loved him. Oh, how Jesus loves you today. Oh, how Jesus wants whatever you want for yourself. Jesus wants a thousand times more. You just don't even know. Jesus loved him, said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. What's he saying? Realign your priorities. Then in verse 31 to the disciples, he says, but many who are first will be last. And the last will be first. Jesus is realigning our priorities. He's saying that his ways are not our ways. In fact, Isaiah tells us, God tells us in Isaiah, his ways are as high as the heavens are above the earth, higher than our ways. Jesus is saying that God reverses the world order and worldly priorities. If you make it your goal to be rich, you'll end up last. But if you make it your goal to be a blessing, God will make you first. He teaches us that through giving, we can have an investment in eternity, not the least of which are the eternal souls that make heaven their home, all because we gave to the work of the kingdom here and now. And though that giving at times may truly be sacrificial, Jesus has promised us this in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first. And I would say in the context of today's message, give first to the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. And when Jesus says other things, he's talking about material things right here and now. Food, shelter, clothing, everything you need. Jesus says, I'll bless you with that. I'll bless you with that. And so he's teaching us a realignment of our priorities. A realignment from worldly priorities to spiritual priorities that will always be manifested in the way we give. You can talk your way around it all you want. This is reality. And God knows whether we understand and practice the heart and spirit of sacrificial giving that was demonstrated by who? By Jesus Christ himself, who gave up the riches and glory of heaven. Imagine leaving heaven to come to earth as a man, to die and suffer for your sins and mine. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. The richest people in this world are the ones who know the blessings of the Lord. The question is whether or not we believe the Bible and whether we want the blessings of God flowing through our lives. It begins, my friend, by giving our lives to Jesus Christ and recognizing him as our personal Lord and Savior. There's some here you've wondered, can I really trust the Lord with my life? All I can tell you is that God always honors those who honor him. God says, if you give me your life, I will bless it. I will use you for my glory. I will bless you and make you a blessing to this generation. For Jesus Christ has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So that's what God does when we give. He recognizes when we give. He rewards when we give. And he realigns our priorities when we give. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me for a word of closing prayer? Altar workers, would you come and take your place? Ushers, would you get ready to receive the offering in just a moment? You, didn't, you thought we'd forgot the offering, didn't you? Not a chance. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm sure the Lord is speaking to a lot of us, speaking to our hearts. Maybe you've tithed all your life and God has said, hey, it's time to, you've been in bondage to the tithe. It's time to break loose from that. Go beyond the tithe. I started tithing with my first job at 15 years of age. At 16, I started giving more than the tithe. And been going up ever since, increasing ever since. Ushers, uh, just come and stand right down near the front here. 
But maybe you've never given and, and you've thought all that, those resources that God has been gracious enough to put into your care or yours, it all belongs to God. And your giving is a way of recognizing it's his. So again, I'll let, the, I'll let the message and the work of the Spirit speak for themselves as we prepare our hearts to give. Today's the first Sunday of February, which means it's Mission Sunday. That's why we got a missionary here today. Maybe, maybe you haven't made a faith promise yet. Why not make one today? And by faith, start giving to missions every month. Doesn't matter what the amount is, start doing something for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Finally, before I pray and we receive the offering and go get some muffins, there may be one here today. You're ready to give your heart to Jesus. You're ready to say, Jesus, I, <clears throat> I know I've been holding out. I've been uncertain. But Jesus, today, I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to trust you with my heart and invite you to come into my life today. If that's you, I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to pray for you. Promise I won't call you out or embarrass you, but I want to pray for you today. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up and put it down right now? God bless you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. In the middle back, I see your hand. Thank you. I'm still on the ground level. Anyone else, you just slip your hand up and say, today, Jesus, today, Jesus, I surrender my heart and life to you. Anyone else on ground level? God bless you, sweetheart. I see your hand. Thank you. One, two, three. Anyone else? Let me go to the balcony. Anybody in the balcony, slip your hand up. God bless you. I see those two hands. Anyone else in the balcony? Anyone else in the balcony? Four or five. Anyone else in the balcony today? You'd say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with my heart and my life. Anyone back down on ground level before I pray? God bless you, sir. I saw your hand. Thank you. Anyone else? God bless you. I see your hand in the back. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand in the back. Six, seven. Anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you. All the way in my back left, I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Tough to quit when God is speaking to hearts of people. Anyone else? Anyone else? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for every raised hand today. Raised hands that represent open hearts to you, Jesus. Lord, come into their lives as they welcome you in and change them forever. Not only forgiving them of their sin and giving them the promise of eternal life, but Jesus, you make a promise, you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. As they receive you as their personal Lord and Savior, seal upon their heart the magnitude of the decision and the commitment they make right now to follow you and to serve you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to close the service by receiving the offering. The altars are going to be open. And for those of you who just want to come and pray and spend some time talking to the Lord or Him talking to you about what you've just heard, you come. Those of you who raised your hands to say yes to Jesus. We'd like to help you begin your walk with the Lord. That's why these folks are up here down front to pray with you. So you come. Balcony folks, you come right down these stairs. We're in no hurry. You come and uh, pray with someone down here and they'll help you begin your walk with Jesus. Once the offering has passed you, you can stand. We're going to sing. First time visitors, I'll see you in the Welcome Center in just a moment. The rest of you, enjoy the muffins. <laughs>